just say uh, um, what an honor it is to be here and just to have that simple invitation uh, to come and preach. Uh, Pastor Josue asked me maybe in February or so, like, hey, I'd like to have you come and preach. And I was like, me? Me? Like, me? Uh, so it's such an honor to be here. And I have to tell you uh, that I've been more excited about what this experience could be and to be a part of this fellowship for even just a little while. I've been more excited to speak here than I have been excited for any other place that I have been able to speak at except for my home. Like, I, <laughs> I love preaching at, at our, our home church. Um, I would like to, uh, like to just thank you for this invitation, but also, do you know how special he is? Do you know? I, I heard his name so many times before Pastor Josh Pennington got us together. I, I heard his name, I was like, who is this guy? He can't possibly be as good as everybody says he is. And then I met him, and I was like, and he's way better looking than I thought. And, and, <laughs> and a beautiful family, so uh, what a presence in this community. Uh, thank you, Pastor Josue. And thank you, uh, Family of Faith Church, and the legacy that you have of good leadership in this community. Um, uh, I, this is not my first time here. This is not my first time speaking on this platform, actually. In 1991, I graduated from Christian Fellowship School as a sixth grader, and I spoke on this platform uh, thanking the good people who were here at that time. And I remember wearing the cap and the gown. I think there was four of us that graduated there at that time. And I remember I was so nervous. I grabbed my little gown and I, 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 I like hitched them all the way up till I, I was like, oh no. I, <laughs> I just remember I was so scared. I'm not quite as scared this time. Uh, you all have had a legacy of faith of leadership in this community, um, of, of allowing the Holy Spirit to, to work through you and in you. And I'm just thankful for a pastor like Josue, who not only, not only talks about what the Holy Spirit can do, he not only teaches about it, but he shows you. He shows you how to live in the Spirit. So uh, I'm thankful for, for all of that. I grew up in Lincoln County. Um, uh, my family, uh, we, we, we were like from the Croton area. Anybody familiar with the Hartford Fair, the Croton, all that, you know, Croton egg farms, you know, you might even smell it from here from time to time. That's where I'm from. Uh, uh, but my parents, Bill and Teresa Warner, kind of helped start the Christian Fellowship School years ago. Um, so we, we've always kind of been in this, this area and this part of town. Um, uh, we, we moved away after we, uh, my wife and I got married, we moved to Dayton. We lived there for seven years, and then we got a call to come back. Um, and so we've been in this area now for almost 15 years. And in 2014, we had a, an invitation that turned into a vision. Uh, the invitation was to come and, and perhaps plant a church in downtown. But um, the guy, I, I don't know if you know, uh, 31 West Ballroom, yeah. like that area, Moe's, like that's where we are. Um, uh, the guy who was buying that building in 2014 um, his wife, now wife, his girlfriend at the time, had a three-year-old son, and he said uh, uh, that she was studying to be a nurse, and she would go to McDonald's Playland, right? You remember when McDonald's, does McDonald's still have Playland? Uh, no? Well, they used to, and, and the three-year-old son would play while she studied to be a nurse, and, and this guy, Tom Atha, was getting ready to purchase this building. He's like, Dave, I'm about ready to, to buy this building, and and my girlfriend, fiance, she's doing this with her kid. And he asked this question, can the church do better? Can the church do better than what culture does? And that question has honestly haunted me <laughs> ever since. Because now we can, we're like, can we do better? Can we get better? Can we do better than what culture offers us? I think the, the answer is yes. And so uh, uh, we started working on this vision. We Ended up launching Little Arrows Play Cafe. Um, I know some of you have been there. Where's John the drummer? Man, 
don't know where he went, but his little one came down there. That's how I met him first. Um, uh, like, w- we've been able to just meet so many people, and we, we started some Bible studies and did some mom's groups and things like that, and ended up starting a church in 2018. So we've been down there for a little while. That's a little bit about me. But today, I want, I want to talk about, actually, Pastor Josue, I, I think you know what you're doing because the Holy Spirit's guiding you. He said, I want to see what hell you've been through. But today we're going to talk about that Jesus is going to be with you when you go through hell again. He's going to take you through to the other side. Jesus made a promise to his disciples that he wasn't going to leave them, not going to leave them where they were, but he's going to get them through to the other side. I want to read a scripture to you. It's Mark chapter 4, uh, verses 35 through 41. It says, that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Oh, man, you guys are on it. You guys are on it already. Like, oh, man, this is going to be fun. This is good. <laughs> Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. And there were also other boats with him. And a furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. And Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. And the disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, he rebuked the wind, and he said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified And they asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. God, as we enter into this passage of scripture, we ask, Lord, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon it, awaken us to the reality of your kingdom here on earth that Jesus brought in and ushered into our presence. Lord, may we live in that kingdom here and now, and may we express gratitude and thanks when you see us through to the other side. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, how many of you heard that story before? Jesus calms the storm. You've heard that. You've, you know that story. And, and I remember hearing that as a little kid on the old flannel graph. Remember flannel graph? Okay. Pastor Josue doesn't remember flannel graph. They didn't have those in Cuba, did they? Okay, so it was like this flannel board and, and they had pictures also made of flannel, and then you could slap them on there and tell the whole story. And then you'd get the pasty white Jesus and the pasty white disciples, and then you'd bring in the storm. And, and, and so, it, like, I remember that story so well, but the problem with hearing a story over and over and over and over again is you start to get accustomed to the fact that somebody could just speak and wind and waves obey and you forget that it's completely unhinged that that would happen. That the wind and waves would just listen to a voice being spoken. But then again, I think, what's more crazy? That Jesus spoke and winds and waves obeyed him or that he was asleep during a storm in a rickety old boat? <laughs> Which is more crazy? That's, that's, that's crazy too. Before we get into the story, I want to give a little context around it. Mark chapter 4, Jesus is doing a lot of teaching in that same boat. He's been been in the boat all day talking to people. He's teaching them, teaching them parables. You know, parables are stories that have a point about the kingdom of God. So he's teaching about the kingdom of God. He tells them about the the parable of the seeds and the soils. You know, there's the path soil, the rocky soil, the the, uh, weedy soil, and the good soil. And some, some produce a little, some produce a lot. He talks about the parable of the lamp. You put it on the table so that it can be seen. It can illuminate the whole world, just like the kingdom of God. He talks about the parable of the growing seed. You plant the seed. You watch it sprout. You watch it grow. And eventually, in season, it will yield fruit. He talks about the mustard seed. It's the smallest seed. And yet, it will grow into such a great bush that even birds will nest in it. You know all these stories. That's all in one shot right there in Mark chapter 4. And he's teaching from this boat. He's 
teaching them about the kingdom of heaven. Like, this is what the kingdom of heaven's like. And it's not really shocking stuff, is it? It's kind of it's almost boring. Like, <laughs> we get it. Seeds. I get it. It's a lamp. I know how that works. So it's kind of like, eh, whatever. I get it. And then suddenly something super fantastic happens to reveal what the kingdom of God is like in the physical presence of earth. Verse 35 says, that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over, you already know it, let us go over to the other side. side." I think that promise is really important to the story. I think we need to hear that promise. He didn't say, let's go to the middle of the lake and experience a storm and die. Thank God he didn't say that. I don't think the disciples would have been on board with that. But don't you think that sometimes that's the promise we hear? Let's go to the middle of this terrible experience and we're just going to languish in our struggles and our difficulties. I was telling somebody here recently, uh, uh, Psalm 23 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for your rod and your staff, they comfort me. It says I'm going to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It doesn't say you're going to stay there. You have to walk through it. Jesus says I'm going to get you through to the other side. I told you that we received this invitation to come to downtown Newark and see if the church could do better than McDonald's. Honestly, our food isn't much better. (laughs) No, actually, it's not not great at all. (laughs) But the vision of what God gave us is much better than what God or what McDonald's can do. But just days after we received that invitation, I developed a blood clot in my arm. My, I didn't even know what it was, actually. My arm, my arm swelled up and turned purple. I was like, well, that's weird. And I was, I was traveling at the time. I went to some animal hospital down in Fairfield County. And, um, and they're like, you have a pinched nerve in your neck. Here, take these pills. You'll be fine. And then we came home. Uh, and then I played music on Sunday. And like my hand's like a club. Like it just is not working right. And um, so we went to... Uh, uh, urgent care, and urgent care is like, yeah, no, yeah, you got to get to the ER right now. And we go to the ER, and they're like, well, you got this giant blood clot. It's the size of a foot-long hot dog. It goes from your clavicle to your elbow, and it's just pinching all this blood off from getting to your heart. And if it goes, you could be in trouble. And uh, I was like, I, I was like pretty young, like I've never had a health issue before. The surgeon walks in, he's like, yeah, here's what we're going to have to do. We're going to have to take that rib out, and we're just going to have to, like, we'll probably take the other one too. And I'm like, whoa, 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 time out, time out. Well, they cleared the clot, and a couple of days later, it started again, and then I was in ICU for two whole weeks. Um, I had surgery to remove the, the first rib under the clavicle. It kind of cleared everything, and then it clotted up again. But what we didn't know was in the midst of that surgery that was semi-successful, they had nicked parts of my innards and I was just bleeding internally and then uh, like three days later then uh, I was getting I had seven units of blood I had to go back for surgery I get all these drains put in um, a stent I have a stent here now so blood flows properly but but then what what followed after that I'm telling you it was hell it was absolute hell it was the worst lowest most difficult time I had ever experienced up to that point, and pretty much since then, this storm that brewed, this storm that came into my life unexpectedly, it, I thought it was going to be the end of me because I remember laying in the hospital bed on Saturday, February 15th, 2014, and I'd just come from radiology where they were just checking things out, and I get into the room, and there's four doctors in there, my entire family, and there's actually four pastors in the room. And you see four pastors come to the hospital, you know something's not good. And I remember there, kind of just in and out of consciousness, I remember praying like, all right, Lord, if you want to take me home, I'm okay with that. I can handle that. 
But I feel like you gave us this vision to do something pretty special downtown. And one prerequisite of me being able to do that is I need to be alive. Because my story's not all that fantastic for people to go, let's, let's memorialize Dave. You know, like it wasn't that good. So I was like, God, if you want me to be alive, I'll go and do this thing. But I need to be alive for it. But if you want to take me home, I'm okay with that too. I thought maybe you might take me to the other side. <laughs> but then what followed was about three months of really hard rehab. It was really a struggle. And I remember many times conversations going like this. God didn't bring you all the way here come on, come on. to leave you here. Yeah. He's going to take you to the other side. The other side. I got to get through this storm so I can realize what God wants me to do on the other side. Now, we're all going to go through periods of, of hell, of torment, struggle. And the thing is, are you ready to go all the way through to the other side? Because he didn't bring you all the way here just, just to leave you here. He didn't say to you, I'm just going to sleep while you go through this storm on your own. Jesus promised you to go to the other side. He didn't bring you this far to leave you here. He promised you to go to the other side. But here's the thing. It's on Jesus' terms. Here's verse 36. Leaving the crowds behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. Took him along just as he was. It's on Jesus' terms. It was just like he was. They leave the crowds on the shore, stays in the boat, just like he was teaching from that same boat. They took him as he was. For the disciples, this means they didn't go back and get all the supplies they needed. They didn't hit the ATM on the way. They didn't stop and grab a snack. They just went, and they took Jesus as he was. Jesus had been teaching all day. Pastor Josue, after a whole day of teaching, are you tired? Are you hungry? Do you just kind of want to be left alone? No, no offense, no offense. Yeah, you just kind of, you just kind of as you are. They bring Jesus as he was. Do you take Jesus as he is? There's a movie out that I, I enjoy. You can judge me if you want. Talladega Nights. The Ballad of Ricky Bobby. You know what I'm talking about? Some of you who have base sense of humor like I do, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There's a scene where they're having a meal and they actually say, I'm going to bless the meal, which is great. But then they create Jesus in the image that they want Jesus to be in. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, uh, uh, Will Farrell is, the, is Ricky Bobby. Ricky Bobby says, um, eight pound, baby Jesus, ain't even said a word yet. You know, he's like praying to the baby Jesus. And then his friend says, no, 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 no. I like to imagine Jesus more of like he's ready to party, but he can take you seriously too. You know, so they, they have this... Actually, it's a really good cultural discussion on what we imagine Jesus to be. The question is, are we going to take Jesus as Jesus is? We need to take Jesus as Jesus is. Otherwise, we create Jesus in our image of what we want Jesus to be. Do you want cosmic Santa Jesus? Do you, do you want transactional Jesus where you say, if I do this for you, then you're going to bless me in this way. Or, oh, Jesus, did you see that person sinned over there? I think you probably ought to punish them because that would make me feel better about myself if you would do that. But we have to take Jesus as Jesus is, not in our image. That means we got to take all the grace that accompanies Jesus and we have to extend it to the people Jesus would extend it to. We have to take all the challenge that Jesus gives us and not stay in our paralyzed state. We have to take all the sacrifice that it means to become like him. He told us to take up your cross every day. 
We have to take that with him. And then we can experience all the joy of the journey just walking with the Lord every single day. Scripture says that there were also other boats with him. Verse 37, a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Imagine that. How many of you like to ride boats and do the boating thing? Yeah. Yeah. I saw yesterday, yesterday was about the nicest day we've had in Ohio since October, I think. (laughs) And then all the white people come in red. (laughs) We're all burnt. I was at um, Kroger last night, and you could tell the softball kids, you know, because they <laughs> just burnt to a crisp. And then I saw uh, pictures of, of people who were on the lake, Buckeye Lake, all day yesterday. I was like, what a, what a joyful time just to be out on the lake. And we had beautiful weather yesterday, but storms can happen like that. Yeah. The Sea of Galilee in particular is, is juxtaposed in this valley between two mountains, And storms can come up like that, and it can overwhelm those old rickety boats. It can still do it now, but those old rickety boats could just get overwhelmed with water. So this storm, this violent storm that everybody knows is possible to happen on that lake. But this one was a doozy, and the water was coming up over the boat. It was overwhelming the boat, and I can just imagine the disciples furiously just bailing water just as fast as they can, but those waves, they can't keep up. Check out what Jesus is doing. Verse 38, Jesus was in the stern, it's the back of the boat, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? He's in the back of the boat. He's just sleeping. He's oblivious to all the things that are going on around him. The storm is raging. The winds are going, the waves are crashing, the disciples are probably yelling at each other, bail, bail, you know, get the water out of here. And finally they wake him up. Don't you care if we drown? I think it's a collective we. They're including Jesus in it. (laughs) You you don't you care if we all, you're going to go down too, bud. Don't you care that you're going to die out here? I think, you know, a lot of those guys were experienced fishermen. They'd probably been through this before. They'd seen this happen before on the fishing boats and over time. They'd been on that lake all their lives. They'd seen storms plenty of times. They'd been through this before. I've been through this before. I got through it before. I can do this again. And this time they were scared. How could Jesus be sleeping through this, though? Last year for uh, at Engaging Work, we did a series called What Keeps You Up at Night? What things are so fearful for you that you can't sleep through the night because of the things that are going on in life? Jesus was sleeping even in the midst of this. Wasn't anything keeping him from sleeping? Not the wind, not the waves, not the storm, not the disciples hollering at each other. But as soon as disciples called out his name, Jesus was attentive to their needs. Now, Jesus had complete faith in God. Jesus never doubted for one second that he was going to make it to the other side. side. He knew where he was going. He never doubted for a second that they weren't going to make it over there. He knew that's where God wanted him to go, so he was going to get there. He knew a storm wasn't going to stop him. He knew rickety boats wouldn't keep him down. He had faith that God would take him to the other side. The experienced fishermen, however, thought they could go through this storm on their own for a while. They thought, we've been through this before. We can get through it again until they realized we can't get through this one on our own. This one's not going to go the same way. He was flooding over into the boat so that it might sink, and they knew what to do. They know how to steer the boat properly. They knew how to get everyone working together. They knew how to do all the things. And for a long time, they probably thought they didn't even need Jesus. How many storms have you been through where you thought, eh, I can get through this one. I don't even need Jesus. 
But the moment they turn from faith in themselves to relying on Jesus, that's the moment they were saved. You might think you can handle storms on your own. You might think you can organize the chaos in your life all by yourself. You might think, I've gotten through worse storms than this before. Heck, you might, not, you might think that Jesus isn't even paying attention. He's falling asleep. He's in the back of the boat. He doesn't even care. But maybe he's just waiting on you to call out to him and rely on him. Maybe he's waiting for you to quit trying to manage all of this chaos by yourself, to finally have faith in him, to have faith like he has in God, that he is the one to bring you to the other side. So check out what happens after that. So 39, he got up, he rebuked the wind, he said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. Now, what's crazy about this, do you guys, do you guys get Greeky with it in here? Do you talk about the Greek sometimes? We like to get Greeky with it. Okay, all right. So this Greek word here, when he says quiet, when he says quiet, be still, the, the word is thamao. Can you say it? Thamao. All right. It means to muzzle or make silent. And, and the, the obedience of the wind and the waves was exactly like if you unwind Mark and go to Mark chapter 1, you'll see early on Jesus goes to a synagogue and a man comes in with a demon. Do you know what he says to the demon? Fumao. Fumao. He says, be silent, be quiet. The obedience of the demon is the same as the obedience of the wind and the waves. For Jesus, the physical storm were a result of a spiritual reality. How many of you can see the physical storm? is the result of a spiritual reality that has happened in your life. Jesus told the storm to be muzzled, to be quiet, just like he told the demon in that man. Even storms and demons are obedient to Jesus. I tell you what, if you aren't challenged by that, you need to put your ears on. Even storms and demons are obedient to Jesus. Yeah? Are we? Oh, there it is. There, that's what I was looking for. We, more, we have more of an obedience problem in the church than we have a worship problem. We can worship. Oh, we can do the fun stuff. We can, we can run the aisles and we can raise our hands and we can sing all the great songs. But then what happens after that? Even the demons and the winds and the waves obey Jesus. Do we have obedience to Jesus? We might complain about storms in our lives. We might complain about the struggles we're going through. We might complain about the spiritual darkness of our day in our time and our culture, but what about obedience? What about our obedience? When Jesus speaks, winds and waves and demons obey, but God's people often just sit around and we wait for the storm to pass before we just go on doing life as we know it. The winds and the waves obeyed and they were quiet. Now, there were other boats with them. Did you notice that? Actually, in the scripture, they weren't the only boat out there. There were other boats with them. This is not just a miracle for Jesus and the gang. This is for quite a few people and quite a few boats experienced this same miracle. I kind of learned from that that when Jesus brings peace to your life, it brings peace to other people's lives as well. Because if there's chaos in your life, it impacts other people. 
There's chaos for everyone around you when you have chaos. But when God brings peace to your life, it brings peace to everyone around you as well. How many of you got caught up in someone else's chaos? Have you ever been in somebody else's chaos? How many of you know that other people have been caught up in your chaos? Mm -hmm. When Jesus brings peace to the chaos, it helps everyone around. It's not just for you. It's for everyone around you. And if you're stuck in some sort of, of addiction, or if you're stuck in some sort of, of issue that you keep coming back to over and over and over and over again, it's bringing chaos not only to you, but to everyone around you. And if you don't want peace for yourself, you want peace for everybody else, just accept that peace that Jesus can bring. It's not just for you. Here's verse 40. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Oftentimes, when I lead groups, and probably you lead groups or you've been in groups, you'll hear the leader say something like this, there's no dumb questions. Now, Jesus, this is kind of a dumb question. Why are you so afraid? Uh, Jesus, did you not just see what was going on? I know that you were asleep for most of it, but like we were going to die there, and this ship was going down with you in it. Uh, this is... We know why we're afraid here. But then he asked them if they still have no faith. Still. Do you not have faith? I think, I think Jesus was kind of asking this. Do you, I've been with you for, for like a while now. You've seen me do things. Do you still not have faith? Do you, do you not have faith that we could actually make it to the other side like I said we were going to do it? I, I told you we were going to go to the other side. Do you not have faith in that? Do you not have faith that Jesus is not going to die in a shipwreck? I mean, what if, what if they just, what if the boat had gone down, the story was over? Yep, they went down. That's it, the end. No, we know that. He's not going to die in a shipwreck. Do you not have faith that after all the teaching of the kingdom of heaven he had done all that day, that if the kingdom of heaven is like that, don't you think that the kingdom of heaven could see you through to the other side? After all you've been through, do you still not have faith that Jesus cares about you? But all they could see was that he was sleeping. When we're in the thick of the storm, fear is our natural reaction. It's almost like we have to fight the fear that comes in us by reminding ourselves that Jesus didn't get me this far to leave me here. We have to remind ourselves that Jesus is the creator of the universe and therefore he is greater than all the storms that we could think of or go through in our lives. We have to remind ourselves that Jesus truly cares about me and he cares about you and he wants the best for you. Faith can be tested in the midst of our storms. There's no doubt about that. But fear will make you forsake your faith in the one who is the Lord over the storm. Jesus has the power to calm the storm or see you through the storm. He might, might not calm that storm, but he'll see you through the storm. And I like this next verse. It's very human. Verse 41, they were terrified. Okay, he asked them why they were afraid. And then it says, they were terrified. And they asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. And what's funny is, they're now more afraid than they were before. <laughs> the Greek bears it out. Verse 40, Jesus asked them why they were delios. Delios means timid or fearful. Why are you fearful, timid? In verse 41, it says, phobiophobos. Are you phobo, phobia? That's, we get our word fear. Okay, it says it twice. They were fear, fear. Okay, they were terrified. Great fear. 
Who is he that even the winds and waves obey him? We just saw Jesus sleeping, doing the most human thing anybody can do is just sleep peacefully. And now he commands winds and waves. Who is this man? Probably one of the craziest things humans could witness. Now humans tend to be more afraid of the thing than the thing behind the thing. Because we see this. We don't necessarily see this. That's orchestrating all of it happening. What if we turn it around? Humans tend to worship the thing rather than the creator of the thing. And sometimes we'll worship not the, what the music is talking about. We worship the musician and the music is so good, we just get lost in that. Sometimes, hey, this is going on in our schools and our culture, these like crystals. You know what I'm talking about? Why are they worshiping the thing? Let's worship the one who created the thing. I don't know if the thing does anything. It seems like a rock to me. But let's worship the creator rather than worship the thing the creator created. When we finally realize that Jesus is creator of the world, where freedom exists, and therefore storms happen, they happen. Because we live in a world where there's freedom and there's fallenness and brokenness. When we finally realize that Jesus is the one who created all of that, we must drop to our knees and we humbly accept that Jesus is also the redeemer of the storm. And he's the redeemer of the issues that are going on in your life and the darkness that's going on in there. And he's the one who makes it possible for you to go to the other side. That's how you get there. He's just waiting for you to fully rely on him. He's waiting for you to call out his name, to wake him up. Jesus, do you not see what's going on here? He's waiting on you to stop trying to paddle with your own power and all the while just creating more chaos around yourself and around your boat. He's waiting for you to to call out to him. He's not so asleep that he can't hear you. He's just waiting for you to care enough to rely on him. I don't know what kind of storm you might be in today, but I do know that Jesus didn't bring you all the way here to leave you here because he wants you to come through to the other side. And I want you to hear this. When Jesus is in your boat, it can't sink. You can't sink with Jesus in your boat. Who here is in the middle of a storm? Who here has been in the storm? We, we've, been, we've all been in a storm for two years. We've been in this storm. I know you're in storms. Who here feels like Jesus just might be sleeping because he hasn't paid attention to you in the midst of your storm where you're needing him most. You feel like he's asleep. He's not there. Who in here just wants Jesus to wake up and pay attention to what's happening around you? Who in here just needs a special touch from Jesus that says, my beloved, I want to bring you to the other side. Let us pray. God, we thank you that we can see in your holy scriptures all of the normal human things that happen in life. There's fear. There's mistakes. There's uh, uh, relationships that are broken. But we thank you also that you provided a way through, a way out, a redemption story for all of them so that we know that, that we're not meant to be left here that you want us to go through with you to the other side. Lord, I I don't know what's happening in the individual lives in this room, but we ask, Lord, that you bring all of your people through to the other side. And may we not experience you sleeping, but you being attentive to us. And may we, as your people, simply call out to you and wake you up 
and bring you into our understanding of reality. You're already there. We just need to see it. We need to open our eyes. So God, open our eyes. May we stop, stop bringing about more chaos into our lives and allow your peace that passes understanding to flow into us and into the lives of others. Lord, we pray all this. And we, we ask, Lord, that, that if you're in a move right now, that you move and that you bring us through these storms. We pray this in Jesus' name and the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.